Good morning. My name is Tom Hall, and I'm the senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh. Welcome to our live stream worship this morning, which will start in just a few minutes with our prelude music. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, friends. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Pittsburgh. It's so good to see you here this morning. Uh, it's our 250th year, and we'll be talking more about that in the coming weeks, about how we plan to honor what God has done here through 250 years. It's so good, to, and you can be a part of it. Um, you are a part of it because you're here today. We invite you to stay after the service for a time of hospitality it's through these doors. There's lots of good things back there and lots of good conversation and good company. So I invite you to stay and get to know someone. We'd also invite you to register your attendance. You can do that a couple of ways. There are cards in the uh, pews in front of you. You can fill that out and drop it in the collection plate. And you can also follow the QR code on the back of the bulletin on your phone, and that will allow you to uh, check in with us. We invite you to do that. We'd also invite you to join us, to go deeper with us. We're having new member conversations in the area back here during the uh, Sunday school hour, and we'll be doing that for the next two or three weeks. So uh, we'd invite you to join us for that. We had a good conversation, I think, this morning. So 9.30, back here in the area behind me for the next few weeks. 
welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Dan is going to lead us now in the call to worship. The Lord has promised that where two or more are gathered, he will be among them. We are more than two, so the Lord has promised to be right here. Let us stand and read the responsive call to worship. It is our God who became the way. By becoming the way, we have access to the highest of heavens. He has touched this space with the power of the Spirit. May he grasp us with that same power. The Lord has done a mighty thing in this place. Let us lift our voices to the praise the King of the universe.
You may be seated. Since our Lord is here with us, let us unbind ourselves of the dark tie of sin that drags our lives away from him. Let us confess our sins to the Lord and unburden our hearts from the guilt. Let us first pray the corporate prayer in unison that you'll find in your bulletin. Then there will be a time of silence where you can confess that which burdens your heart. Let us pray. Lord, we make our own stairways to reach all kinds of gods. Reach out to everything in this world other than you. We know you did not create us to wallow in shame, guilt, or embarrassment. Yet, we hold on to them. Lord, free our hearts from the things that weigh us down. May we trust that your grace is big enough for our biggest sin. And may we live knowing that you died for the smallest sins in our lives. Let us continue to confess. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we ask that you have mercy upon us, sinners in need of saving. It is in your Son's name. Amen. Let me share with you the best news you could possibly hear. We never stand on our own merit. If we did, we would be doomed. The Lord doesn't leave us to our own strength. No, he cleanses us from our filth and sets a new robe upon us. The Lord has done something great in this place. He has done something great today. You heard the good news that our God has removed our transgressions from us as far as the east is from the west. Let us respond with a life Filled with his grace. Loving him and loving others. Amen. I invite the children to come forward and Noah, to hear Noah uh, lead the children's uh, sermon. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. A good morning. Okay. So today our scripture lesson comes from the book of Genesis and it deals with um, Jacob. Now you may have heard of Jacob. Do you remember maybe the story of Jacob tricking his brother Esau, trading his blessing for a bowl of soup. Is that familiar? It's okay if it's not. Well, this story actually comes right after that when Jacob has a very special dream. So we're going to read from this story Bible. Okay. Can you see all right? Jacob's dream. Esau was very angry when he found out that Isaac gave Jacob the blessing. So Rebekah, that's Jacob's mom, gave Jacob the blessing. No, so Rebekah sent Jacob away for a while. Jacob walked and walked. When it was night, he stopped to rest. He put a stone under his head for a pillow. You can see it there. While he was sleeping, he had a beautiful dream. 
in his dream, he saw a ladder going from the earth into heaven. Angels were going up and down on that ladder. God was standing at the top. God said to Jacob, I am taking care of you. I will be with you wherever you go. When Jacob woke up, he said, Now I know that God is with me. He took the stone that he had slept on, and he stood it upright. He called that place Bethel, which means house of God. He left the stone there to remind him of his dream. So this story is really kind of magical, isn't it? Wouldn't it be amazing if you had a dream of a great ladder and you saw angels going up and down on it? Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, what this story really teaches is not simply that we can see visions of the heavens or of God or ladders or angels, but that God makes a promise to us. Do you remember what he said to Jacob? He said, I am taking care of you. And that's the truth with us. God takes care of each and every one of us. No matter how big our lives are, no matter how small our lives are, God takes care of us. Do you understand? Okay. Let's pray. Please repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for holding us in your hands. Lord, make us like Jacob and see with amazement your promises. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay, you can go to Children's Church now.
By the way, I haven't told the choir, but right before the final hymn, I'll ask everyone to be seated again because I have another announcement I, I need to make. Um, friends, would you pray with me? Almighty God, rain down your Holy Spirit that we might see you working in us and everywhere in your creation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're beginning a new sermon series today in celebration of this church's 250th year uh, of service here in Pittsburgh. We're calling this series Standing Stones. Over and over in the, new, in the Old Testament, people piled up stones to remind themselves of something that God had done in a particular place. Sometimes God commanded them to do that. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to be exploring some of those stories of standing stones. And of course, this church is a standing stone. This church is a monument to God's faithfulness to the people of Pittsburgh for 250 years, although this building was finished in 1905. People have been worshiping here since 1773, if not before. And that is worth remembering. The preaching text today is from Genesis 28. It's a story of God working to transform a man named Jacob. And in this story, the stone that Jacob used as a pillow, Jacob uses to become a monument to remind Jacob and himself of what God had done in that particular place. And it turned out to be a pivotal event, not just in the life of Jacob, but in the life of all of God's people then and now. A stone becomes a pillow. So here's the context for today. Remember Genesis 1 through 11 is the story of the fall of humankind. It's the, how sin takes over the whole world. It's the consequences of human sin. But then in Genesis 12 begins the new story of what God is doing to redeem his good creation. And of course, we know in Genesis 12, God comes to a man named Abraham and promises to make a great nation out of him and his descendants. The promise got passed on to his son Isaac, and now here we come to Genesis 28, and the time had come for the promises to be passed on to the third generation, Jacob. Now, if you ever think that the Old Testament has been superseded, or the Old Testament is just old, it's myths and legends, it's irrelevant, I hope you will see from the message today that is not true. Just as relevant as ever. Well, Jacob had a twin brother, of course, named Esau, and Jacob was born second into a world where being the firstborn meant everything. The firstborn got the greatest part of the inheritance. The firstborn typically got the father's blessing. And it turns out that the firstborn of the two twins, Esau, happened to be the Son, the father always wanted. Esau was a man of the outdoors. He was a man's man. But Jacob was the stay-at-home type. He was his mother's favorite. But God had told his mother that Jacob would rule his brother. The younger would rule the elder. Now, the author of Genesis who wrote this had none of our modern understanding of psychology, of course. But we all understand what can happen when you grow up without the love of your father. So many of us do anything to get our father's approval. And how much of our motivation in life comes from our, needs, our need to be approved, especially approved by our father? And so Jacob had done the unthinkable. When his father Isaac was old and blind, he pretended to be his brother. He and his mother conspired to trick Isaac into giving Jacob the blessing that was intended for Esau. 
When Esau found out that he had been tricked, he swore that he would kill Jacob. And so in this passage, Jacob is literally running for his life. Genesis 28, verses 10 through 21. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth which is with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I will return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. Well, the story I just read is mentioned, referred to only one other time in the Bible, in John 1, when Jesus is recruiting the disciples. I'm going to read John 1, verses 45 through 51. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The word of the Lord. I know some of you are fans of the streaming series Yellowstone, Yellowstone. And you know that it's about a family trying to defend itself, defend its land, defend its way of life against all the forces that are trying to take those things away. And at the same time, they're having to defend themselves from each other. They are literally trying to keep from killing each other. Well, last week, of course, week before last, was the mid-season finale of the, what's the final show, and the final season. And it ended with a cliffhanger, of course. Two adult children were literally plotting, trying to put in motion plans to kill each other. And somebody would say that the Bible is not relevant to today. 
Or let me put it this way. If you know the story of Jacob, then you know that the plot line of Yellowstone is really not that original after all. Like one of the characters in the series Yellowstone, Jacob was neglected by his father and desperate for his blessing. Cunning, and by cunning, Jacob gets it. But then he's on the, on the run with nothing. The passage said, he came to a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. And that is the Hebrew writer's way of saying in a very economical way, he's nowhere, he's got nothing. Jacob's father and grandfather, well, Abraham the grandfather, Isaac the father, they had had these glorious experiences, these massive experiences of God. But Jacob, at least till now, had nothing. Surely he'd heard the stories from his elders, the promises that God gave to them, but to him, they weren't real yet. Jacob was a conniving mess. So he lay down to sleep, and he put his head on a rock. He laid down and used a rock for a pillow. <laughs> i got to say it, he hit rock bottom. <laughs> That's the definition, I think. But then he had a dream. A dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And above it all stood the Lord. Jacob had done nothing, nothing to earn God's favor. In fact, just the opposite. Jacob wasn't looking for anything from God. He wasn't praying, and yet that is exactly when God shows to give him this amazing, life-altering, history-bending dream. There was a stairway reaching all the way from earth to heaven, meaning that the heavenly realm and the earthly realm were connected. The ineffable had reached down into the tangible. The infinite had be become finite. The sublime was touching the everyday. And the angels of God were coming down and spreading out across the earth. God's messengers were everywhere. But the angels were going back up as well. They were taking what was going on in the earth and they were bringing it back up into heaven. And Jacob, it turned out, had not been alone. He had not been alone after all. He had just been out of touch with what was going on in the heavenly realm, what was God, what was out of touch with what God was doing all around. And not only that, God was looking down on it all. Some translations say he was actually standing over Jacob. God said to Jacob, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I am with you. I am never going to leave you. I'm going to watch over you wherever you go. I'm going to give you this land. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. They'll spread out everywhere. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Well, Jacob woke from this dream and he was terrified. He said, the Lord was here and I wasn't even aware of it. How awesome is this place, this is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So in the morning, he took the stone he'd used for a pillow, and he made a monument out of it. And he called the place Bethel. It's two Hebrew words, Beit and El, house and God. Like Bethlehem is Beit Lechem, house of bread. Beit Bethel is house of God. Bethel became one of the most important sites for worship in all of Israel, second only to Jerusalem. You know, we all have this sense, this nagging sense, we, it's really hard to get rid of, that we have to work our way to God. There is the story in Genesis chapter 11, archetypical of this, the Tower of Babel. Where the people had tried to build a tower up to heaven. Of course, they thought they could do it. 
The Christian faith is totally unique among all the world's faiths in saying that God comes to you. God has to come to you. One of my seminary professors explained it this way, and I think I've said this here a few times. He says that some faith traditions imagine that a life of faith is building a scaffolding up to the top rafters of the church. And up there in the top rafters of the church, God has placed his keys to this kingdom. He's placed the keys to heaven, the keys to the church. And if you work hard enough and long enough throughout your life, you might be able to build a scaffolding up into the top and then at the last have the strength to reach the keys of God. But then he said there are other traditions that say, oh, no, no, that's too hard. That God takes his keys, the keys to his heart, the keys to his house, and he just places them on the table. And he just expects you to go in and pick up the keys. My professor said, no. No, what really happens is that God comes in search of you. God comes from heaven to earth, and he, he finds you, and he takes you, and he takes this closed fist of yours, and he pries open your fist, and he places the keys to his kingdom in your hand, and he closes your fingers around his keys, and then he says, take care of my house. That's what happened to Jacob. Jacob wasn't looking for God. He wasn't talking to God. He wasn't praying to God. He wasn't even thinking about God. But then he realized that God had come and stood over him. And not only did he not die, God spoke the most comforting words anyone could possibly hear. And what happened next? Jacob is converted, right? He's a new man. No, <laughs> no. He said, if God will be with me and watch over me and give me food and clothes and take care of me and keep me safe and bring me back, then the Lord will be my God. All that God had done to reach out to Jacob in the middle of nowhere and give him this incredible assurance and Jacob was still putting conditions on God. If you do this for me, then I'll follow you. But did you notice? While Jacob was putting conditions on trusting God, God was already, already all in for Jacob. There were no conditions. Tim Keller points out that when God spoke to Jacob and said, I will be with you, there is not a single if. And all those promises. <laughs> so how do we apply this? First, you know, if you are part of a dysfunctional family, and who isn't, there's hope for you. In fact, if you are the primary cause of dysfunction in your family, <laughs> there is hope for you. So the first lesson is, you are not defined by your dysfunction. We're not defined by our dysfunction. We're not defined by our dysfunction. Julian Smith is a professor at Valparaiso, Valparaiso University. He wrote just a few days ago in Christianity Today an article, How to Read Yourself into Genesis. How to Read Yourself into Genesis. He said, you are part of the story of this dysfunctional family, and that's a good thing. Smith said, we bear the image of the God of boundless power and love. Our story began not in sin, but in goodness. And so he says, we have to keep reminding ourselves of that. We have to do whatever it takes to grasp that truth. Remember Genesis 2, he, he says? Remember Genesis 2, the story of the second creation story where God is the gardener walking through his beautiful creation and God scoops down and picks up some dirt and forms the first human being and breathes life into him. We're made by a loving God. That defines us. The world just wants to tell you it's whatever your dysfunction is. That defines you. Your dysfunction is really okay. No. No. You're defined by the God who made you. 
for fallen creatures, it's not our fallenness that defines us. So Smith says, we ought to begin our day in stillness and quiet, in prayer and worship, and in gratitude. Gratitude. Friends, we're not defined by our dysfunction. No, we're fine. We are defined. Secondly, we're defined by the God who comes down to us. We're defined by the God who comes down to us. I think God was attracted to the dysfunction of Jacob. He was attracted to the brokenness, the helplessness of Jacob. God so often, as we know, chooses the weaker to shame the strong. He chooses the poor to shame the rich. He chooses the weaker for special blessing. God was attracted to the total inability of Jacob to do anything for himself. Jacob was not even interested in reaching out to God. But God, you see, had chosen, already chosen Jacob to be the bearer of the seed of the next generation of God's people. And nothing was going to stop God from pulling that off. So when Jacob failed again and again and again, God was always there working to make him whole again. And God is always there for us, working again and again and again to restore us to our rightful place in his family. God created us to spend eternity with him. He'll stop at nothing to make sure that happens, to bring us home. We are defined, friends, by the God who came to us. And so, who is this God who came to us? Well, the story of Jacob's ladder is only mentioned one other time in the Bible. It's in John 1. I just read the passage when Jesus is out recruiting his disciples. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathanael said, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? And it was then that they come upon Jesus. And Jesus tells Nathanael, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael, he's stunned. He said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. But Jesus said, you will see greater things than that. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is the stairway. Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the the intersection between heaven and earth. Nathaniel, you don't work your way to heaven. You don't get it by climbing up some flight of stairs. You get to heaven by coming to me, by allowing yourself to be found by me. Everywhere Jesus went in his ministry, you saw this happening. You saw the heavenly dimension breaking in. You saw life as God intended breaking in. What we call miracles, I think, was life as God intended, breaking in. I suppose we love shows like Yellowstone because they reflect our, it, they reflect our condition and maybe because they have a lot of money and live in a beautiful place in Montana, I don't know. But we're all part of this messed up family trying to make our way in the world and trying to keep from killing each other in the process. The amazing thing is God finds something attractive in families like ours. He finds something attractive in dysfunctional people like us. So he came to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus took our dysfunction upon himself and he became the bridge for us between heaven and earth. Friends, you are not defined by your dysfunction. You are defined by the God who made you and came to you and lived for you and died for you. The God who came to you when you were alone, unable to help yourself, he 
came to you when you weren't praying or looking or even thinking about him. So when Jacob woke up, and from his dream, he made a monument of the stone he used for a pillow. What a great monument. And he called it Bethel. He said, this is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Genesis 32 says that God came again to Jacob in the middle of the night. But this time they wrestled until morning. And God gave him a new name. He changed his name to Israel. And of course we know that God kept his promises to Jacob. Jacob went on to become a prolific father. And out of his sons came the twelve tribes of Israel. And centuries later, out of his line came the Messiah, Jesus Christ who claimed as himself the intersection between heaven and earth. And all the people on earth were blessed through him. And you know what, friends? When people wake up and they see Jesus being attracted to them, when they see Jesus coming to them, standing over them in spite of their conniving and their dysfunction, sometimes Sometimes they will let the heavenly realm break into their lives and sometimes they will put a stone, one on top of the other, like our ancestors did, right here in this place. And they will say, how awesome is this place? This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Would you pray with me? Lord of heaven and earth, we thank you for this story in the life of Jacob, how you found him out on the run in the middle of nowhere and gave him the great vision of your angels going out over all the earth. We thank you for standing over Jacob when he didn't even know you were there. And so in the same way, Lord, we thank you for standing over us, for not giving up on us, for promising to be with us, fallen and dysfunctional as we are. We thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son to live and die for us and to be for us the intersection between heaven and earth. We pray for a world that, like Jacob, doesn't know you're there. The world doesn't know you're there, Lord. Lord, send your angels out to wake your people from their sleep so that all the world will acknowledge you as Lord. We pray for your peace, your shalom, especially for the people of Ukraine. We pray for our nation, especially this week. We pray for the people of California who are suffering from too much rain and snow and floods. And we lift up the people suffering from the effects of violent weather in the south. Lord, be with all the search and rescue and recovery folks. We pray for our city. We pray that it might be a beacon of hope, that it might be safe and secure for everyone. And we ask you to be with those with no home of their own. We pray for the city center churches today, that together we might reveal the love of Jesus Christ going out to the world. And we pray for First Presbyterian Church. Lord, help us to care for those you've entrusted to us. Be with our mission partners. Be with those in recovery. Be with those who mourn. Lord, we pray that everyone who comes here and sees these stones would say, surely this is the house of God. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
All day long, every day, the world tells you who you are and what you're supposed to be. The world lifts up our dysfunctions and says, well, that's who you are. And yet we know better. And so that's why we take a minute every Sunday to say together the essentials of our faith. I'd invite you to join and stand with me as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we have been nourished by God's word, as we have proclaimed our faith, so we respond in that same faith, giving to God what he has given to us, giving of our time, our talents, and our resources to the work of God's church in the world as he comes to be among us. So I ask that you give generously, knowing that God has granted us much. It's hard to take the first step when I don't know the way. Each turn is so uncertain. I learn to walk by faith. But you gave me a promise that you would. Your plans for me are perfect. I never need to fear. For though at times I feel alone, I know that you are near. My heart just longs to follow. I'm willing to
Let us pray. Gracious Lord, for these gifts that we bring before you as but a portion of what you have given to us, we give you thanks, and we give them back to your glory and honor for the work of your church in the world in proclaiming Christ and him crucified. All this we ask and pray in his name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to thank the choir and our guest organist today, Ethan LaPlaca. Ethan, you are our favorite guest organist. God bless you. Thank you. And thank you to our many amazing musicians. It's such a joy um, that you bring to us every week. You know, one of the things I longed for, I hoped for, I prayed for in becoming a minister was to work with the great music department. And that prayer has been fulfilled in this church. And for the last seven years, I've got to serve with just an amazing minister of music and organist, Ryan Croyle. Um, he is a joy. His collegiality, his grace, his compassion, his professionalism equal his musicality, his virtuosity. He is amazing. But Ryan tells us he's got a growing family. He's raised two young daughters and a growing architectural practice, his own architectural practice, which he started during the pandemic. And now it's, it's overwhelming him. It's keeping very busy. So he gave us his notice that we've got three more months with Ryan and he'll be leaving us to be more, spend more time with his family and um, to concentrate more on his practice. And I shamedly, unashamedly tried to bribe him but to stay, but no good. So we have some time. We have three months to uh, thank Ryan. We have three more months to enjoy his great virtuosity and leadership among us. And we have some more time to thank him for his great ministry among us. So please, in the next few months, pray for Ryan and his family and... Uh, Maybe grab him, get him back here, but no. Um, pray that God will raise up another successor in the great tradition of great music here in this church. thought you needed to know that from me personally. So I'd invite you to uh, stand and let's join together in singing our last hymn.
Friends, we are not defined by our dysfunctions. We're not defined by our fallenness. We are defined by the God who tore open a hole in the fabric of time and space and sent his son into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ lived for us, he died for us, and he was raised for us, and he became for us the intersection between heaven and earth. And now may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your heart to love. And may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.